So, let me first say, in this video I'm using uh, the built-in mic on my laptop and recording through the laptop. So, let me know how the audio sounds, how the video looks. Okay, this video I'm going to talk about the basic idea behind natural deduction. So, what this thing even is, what the point is, as opposed to the specific details of how to do a natural deduction problem. We'll address those in another video. So what is natural deduction? This is a tool we have for testing whether an argument is valid. Um, we have natural deduction both TFL and in FOL, first order logic, the expanded, more powerful logic that you're learning after the midterm. Now, you might wonder why would we need this additional tool for TFL, right? In TFL, you've already learned how to use truth tables to tell whether an argument's valid or not. Many of you will say, well, students often tell me they find natural deduction much more difficult than truth tables. So why do we have this extra thing when we already know how to address that problem? The short answer is truth tables don't work anymore once we go to FOL. But the natural deduction method that we can use in TFL just needs a little slight extension. We just add a little bit more into it, um, and then it works for FOL. So that's why you're going to learn this with TFL. It's a little bit easier to learn it with uh, without adding those extensions on first, and then when we get to FOL, it's a little easier to learn. Okay, so we'll start with the TFL version of natural deduction. I should be clear, by the way, re you'll remember from learning truth tables that there are two things you can do with truth tables, and you can only do one of them with natural deduction. That is, if you're doing a truth table for an argument and checking whether it's valid, you can use a truth table to show that a valid argument is valid. You can also use a truth table to show that an invalid argument is invalid. But a natural deduction proof can only be used to show that a valid argument is valid. You can't use it to show that an invalid argument is invalid. To do that kind of job in FOL, we'll need something else. That, that'll be our chapter on interpretations. We'll talk about that later. Okay. So that's what natural deduction is supposed to do. It's a way of showing that a valid argument is valid. Let me give you the basic idea here. So I've put on the screen a valid argument that we've seen before. We talked about this in the first week of class. And I want to start with this, exa with this example for a reason. Okay. This was on the very first challenge problem set, um, I asked you whether this argument looks valid or whether the argument with, uh, that looks the same but with the conclusion that Alfred didn't get good grades, whether that's valid. And the reason why I think I, I'm choosing this example is because at that point you didn't know anything about truth tables. We hadn't introduced them yet. But still we had a class where when we took up the answers to the problem set, I tried to persuade you that this version of the argument, this argument that's on the screen now, that is actually valid. I want to recall how we did that. Okay. Um, I am going to do one thing that we didn't have available at the time. You hadn't learned uh, any of the connectives yet. But it is helpful, I think, to symbolize the argument in TFL. So I'm just going to do this quickly because that's not the topic we're working on here. I think in order to symbolize this argument, we just need three atomic sentence letters. So here are the ones I've chosen. So we'll use S for Alfred studied, G for Alfred got good grades, and E for Alfred enjoyed, enjoyed university. Then our argument looks like this when we symbolize it. Premise one, if Alfred studied, then he got good grades. That would be S arrow G. Premise two, if he didn't study, then he enjoyed university. So if he did not study, then he enjoyed university. Premise three, Alfred didn't enjoy university if he didn't get good grades. So he didn't enjoy university if he didn't get good grades. That's premise three. Therefore, conclusion, Alfred got good grades. This is the argument we're looking at. So if I want to persuade you 
you who don't know anything about truth tables, let's imagine. If I want to persuade you that this argument is valid, a way I might go about it, and a way I did in fact go about it in class, is to start by assuming the premises are true, and just go step by step and say, well, if you know these premises are true, then this sub-conclusion must be true, and if that's true, then here's another step we can take, and then just chain together little steps until we eventually get down to the conclusion. And if all the steps along the way are valid, then the argument as a whole has to be valid. That's the kind of thing that we do in natural deduction. Okay? In natural deduction, you start with your premises, and uh, the natural deduction system gives you a list of allowable little steps that are maybe obviously valid, and you can chain those together to get from the premises to the conclusion. And if you can come up with a chain like that, where every step is valid, then the argument going from the beginning to the end has to also be valid. So how might this look here? Here's a way of going about it. I might say, okay, all of these premises are conditional, right? They, none of them tell me directly whether Alfred studied or not, whether he got good grades or not, whether he enjoyed university or not. But I can say this, right, without even looking at the premises, I know that either Alfred studied or he didn't. Either sentence S is true or it's false. It's not going to be both, it's not going to be neither. We're in one case or the other. Let me write those out. So either he studied, that's one possibility, or he didn't study. If I'm saying S is either true or false, that's the same as saying either S is true or not S is true. My strategy is going to be to say, I'm going to look at each of these cases, and I want to say, if I assume S is true, then G has to be true. So if I assume he studied, then he got good grades. And also, if he didn't study, he still must have got good grades. And I know we're in one case or the other, so then he must have got good grades, period. Okay, so assume he studied. Well then, looking at that assumption, plus premise one that says, if he studied, then he got good grades, that tells me he must have got good grades. When you put together an if-then sentence, plus the antecedent of that sentence, the consequent has to be true as well. Okay, so that's one case checked. Let's check the other case. Assume he didn't study. Well, premise one doesn't tell, tell me anything about this case, but premise two does. Here we have, again, a conditional sentence, if not S, then E, and I'm assuming that the antecedent of that conditional is true, so, putting these two things together, I know he must have enjoyed university, because that's what premise 2 tells me about this case. But now, if I compare this sub-conclusion, this intermediate step I've got, knowing that he enjoyed university in this case, and I look at premise 3, premise 3 tells me if he didn't get good grades, then he didn't enjoy university. That's enough for me to know this, the antecedent of this conditional must be false, because if it were true, just by the same kind of steps we were just doing, it must be that Alfred didn't enjoy university, but I know he did enjoy university, so this can't be true, not G can't be true. If not G can't be true, that's another way of saying G can't be false, in other words it must be true. So, that's enough for me to know, if Alfred didn't study, then he must have got good grades. So I put these two things together and I say, Alfred must have got good grades. Okay. That's what something like a proof or a derivation might look like, more or less in English. I know I've used some symbols here but I'm using those mainly as abbreviations for the English stuff. And that's the kind of argument that I went through in class, on the whiteboard, without symbols, back in week two of this module. So what natural deduction aims to do is to formalize this kind of process, right? So I said, for example, we've got a conditional sentence and we've got its antecedent so we can get its consequent. You have a rule in natural deduction for TFL that says, when you have an arrow sentence and you have the antecedent, then you can get the consequent. We have a rule that says, 
if I know that some or sentence is true, that is, I know that we're in one of two cases, and I check that some conclusion I care about is true in either case, then that conclusion must be true, period. That rule is called or elimination. We'll talk about it later. So we're going to get a finite list of about a dozen rules of little patterns of inferences, little steps you can take. And then the challenge in a natural deduction problem is to start with whatever premises you're given and chain together steps that follow those rules to get to the conclusion. I'm going to stop there. That's the idea behind natural deduction. We'll get into the nitty-gritty in just a second.